You're listening to the Vibrant Happy Woman podcast, episode number 159. We're talking about the brave art of motherhood today, how to be confident in your choices as a mom when life throws you curveballs and confusion and comparisons. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Dr. Jen Rydae, former burned out mom of six turned happiness whisperer. And I'm here to help you get off that hamster wheel and make time for yourself without the guilt so you can live a balanced, calm, heart-centered life. With over 2.5 million downloads, this is the Vibrant Happy Women Podcast. Hey there, Jen here, and welcome back to Vibrant Happy Women. I'm so glad you listen. And hey, listen, I want to tell you something. You are a freaking rock star. Take a moment and smile big. Give yourself a little hug or a mental hug if you're driving and appreciate yourself because I sure do. You freaking rock. Way to go. So today we have an amazing episode for you with Rachel Martin, who is talking about the brave art of motherhood. She moved as a single mom from up north to down south (laughs) with seven kids. It's an amazing story. And I love her ideas of how we can do it without comparing ourselves to other people and really know what our right path is. We all really need that to listen to our intuition and be confident in our choices and in our path. So stay tuned for that. Also, this week, I am hosting that brand new workshop. It's a live chat, not a bunch of slides me talking, some other women joining me, we're going to talk about energy. The workshop's called Be the High Vibe You, Replenishment and Energy Workshop. You know, I've talked to a lot of women and I've noticed a common theme. How do we stay consistent with our growth? How do we actually become that person we want to be? We know all the things we need to do, but how do we lock it in and actually be her? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in this workshop, how to lock in that self-care, how to lock in those thoughts that help you feel energized and confident and radiant and positive. What are the tools we need to be using every day that will help us show up as the woman and the mom and the wife and the friend we want to be? I know all of you can see her. You know who she is. You have felt her when you meditate. How do we lock it in and actually show up day by day by day more and more as this vibrant and happy version of yourself? She's in there. She's coming out, but let's bring her out faster so you can feel amazing every day. That's the goal. This stuff really works because when I think back to who I used to be, kind of depressed, kind of negative. Okay, a lot depressed and a lot negative. (laughs) And now when I wake up, I feel so much excitement most days. And when I don't, I have some tools to get me back into that excited state. So the goal of the workshop is to help you learn those tools. And I'm going to give you something really cool. We're going to talk about what it takes to be her, be that vibrant, happy you every day, that high vibe version of you. High vibe emotions are love, joy, peace, confidence. Oh, and they feel so good. And we love when we feel that way. But sometimes we feel stuck in states of depression, fear, anxiety, frustration, or shame. And those are the low vibration emotions. I'm going to teach you in the workshop how to shift up and stay up more often so you can love your life. So you can be Maria from The Sound of Music, who I always aspired to be. (laughs) So definitely, definitely join me. I can't wait to see your happy, shining faces. If you want to be there, if you want to be the high vibe you, Sign up at jenriday.com slash energy. Well, we have a great episode for you today, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's start down that path right now. Rachel Martin is my guest today, and she believes in the power of the human spirit to overcome, to thrive, and to find deep joy. And because of that, she pours out her heart via these platforms. She's the writer behind the site FindingJoy.net and author of The Brave Heart of Motherhood, a fantastic book. Her articles have been translated into over 25 languages. Her site reaches millions of visitors every month, and she has a robust, engaged Facebook community. Her content's been featured in The Huffington Post, iVillage, The Today Show, Star Tribune, NBC Parents, and many more. 
She speaks worldwide, encouraging moms and entrepreneurs to live each day with purpose and drive. Beyond that, she's a single mom to seven and calls Nashville, Tennessee her home. Welcome to Vibrant Happy Women, Rachel. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to chat today. I am too. I am too. And I know you have a really fantastic quote for us. What is that? Well, I have two quotes. I'm going to share with you that because you love the quote that kind of inspires our lives. And it's actually the one that drives me is one by Eleanor Roosevelt that says, do one thing every day that scares you. But I have to add to that, that in my room, my office next to that, I have another quote that says, do one thing every day that makes you happy. Mm. And I think that there's profound truth in both of those being side by side. And, uh, Sometimes the things that scare us, the things that make us fearful, that make us pause are actually the places in life that can make us deeply happy. We just have to take that step. Mm -hmm. Those are great. Scares you and makes you happy. They are good side by side ones for sure. Yeah, they are. I didn't even realize that they were side by side until my I think it was my 12 year old said to me, do you know, mom, that you have those two quotes that are almost the same except for one word. And I thought, oh, interesting. (laughs) Yeah, really, really. Well, how have you followed that quote in your life or those quotes, I guess, the two of them? Well, I started realizing that I was kind of a slave to fear for many of my years, and I didn't want to admit it because that seems fearful admitting it. So it was a dichotomy there. But all of a sudden, there was a day in my life, probably about 10 years ago, where I realized life is going to pass me by no matter what. And it's my job to either decide to live life with full intention and really grab the days that I have or just allow it to pass by. And the older I got, you know, there's more that you come face to face with. I had had friends that were in their 30s that died from cancer with young kids. And I remember thinking like, I don't know the number of days that I have. And for me to live thinking I'll put off till tomorrow doing the things I love and want to do or that make me happy is almost being foolish. It's assuming that I'm going to get to live to be 80. And I decided to no longer live with that assumption, but to live with this kind of tenacious desire that Eleanor Roosevelt really talks about when she says, do something every day that scares you. There's oftentimes little things that can scare us. It's not like we have to jump from a plane. Sometimes it's just making a tough phone call or deciding to change one thing in our life. And actually, those things can become, like we talked in the beginning, places of great happiness and joy. So name a couple of things that have scared you that you did anyway. Just give us some examples. I went to Haiti to document a mission trip on my own. Most people that go to Haiti go with a group of people. This is the first time that I had ever traveled out of the country. And I had an opportunity because my sight had grown and to do that. And it terrified me. Mm -hmm. But it became one of the most profound and life-changing places actually in my entire life. Moving to Tennessee. From living, I'm, I grew up in Minneapolis, lived there my entire life. About two and a half years ago, I decided to do the hard thing, sold most of my stuff, packed everything up, drove a 28 foot Penske truck in the middle of the winter through Wisconsin and Illinois and moved to Tennessee. And it's been an enormous blessing. Wow. And you had all your kids with you. <laughs> I did. I did. And it was one of those days where the night before you could hear it was the Alberta Clipper wind roaring through Minnesota at that mm-hmm. time. And I remember thinking, how am I going to drive that truck? And there were all these advisories for vehicles because of the wind. And the entire time driving it, I was terrified of it, honestly. But I just remember gripping the wheel, driving through Wisconsin, trying to keep it on the road. And as time went on, I started to actually love the experience of driving this truck. I'd wave at truck, semi-truck drivers. (laughs) It was just, and by the time we got to Kentucky and almost to Tennessee, I thought to myself how this was an amazing experience that I had in my bucket list of life and how much I enjoyed learning about the nuances of of driving a giant (laughs) truck across country. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. And seeing the good out of it. I love that. Well, let's dive into your story of having seven kids, being a single mom and, you know, your low point in general and your experience of that. Well, I do have seven kids. A lot of times people will ask me many questions. Really? You have seven kids? And I'll say, yes, yes, I do. And then, you know, they're the greatest joys of my life and they're a ton of work. And I don't think that most of us ever go into parenthood thinking, you know what, one day I want to do this all on my own. (laughs) Uh, I think we we all go in with this ideal image of what we like and what we want. And 
oftentimes life happens and there are different stories that happen. I wrote a quote about how sometimes life, you have to learn to find joy in the story that you're living because it doesn't look like that picture of what you wanted. And if someone had told me 24 years ago that I'd be a single mom, I would have said, no way, no way. But for the last six and a half years, that's been my story. I went through a really challenging divorce and came face to face with some pretty severe financial issues that I'd hid behind and I felt a lot of shame with. And in those days, I came face to face with, do I ignore this or do I stand up and take care of it? Not knowing all the answers, but teaching my kids that we can do hard things and we can change situations that seem unchangeable. So that story of being a single mom, like in that space, as challenging as it is, it's also been one of the most, the places that I've the most pride because it's been a place where I decided to not back down, where I decided I'm just going to put myself out there and not allow labels or shame to define. Mm. So what kind of shame do you think a lot of women are feeling for divorce? I mean, where is it coming from themselves, other people? I think it comes from all over the place. Most often we can say it's everybody else that puts the shame on. But I deeply believe that we are our own strongest critic. Mm -hmm. And at least for myself, I tend to think, what are they thinking about me? Oh, I've let people down. And that voice, that criticism that, oh, you're not good enough. Oh, look, you failed or all of that. It can be so deafening that it takes a lot of, I would say, diligence and personal introspection to say, you know what? I am worth not allowing those thoughts to define who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. And I've had some struggles with my two oldest teenagers, as well as marriage and in the past more so. But um, I feel like sometimes you just have to turn the shame off. Sometimes you get tired of being in that energy and you just say, nope, I'm not going there. Did that happen for you as well? It really did. I don't know if it was getting close to being 40 and now I'm over 40, but all of a sudden at a certain place, I was like, I don't want to live with shame anymore. I don't want to live with that own inner critic voice defining what I can do because oftentimes shame, it distorts the truth. It denies truth. And the truth is that we are stronger and more capable than oftentimes we even think. And we can have this life of happiness despite the circumstances that are around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you went to Nashville, right? Yes, I'm in Nashville. Okay. Oh, and everybody wants to visit. They're like, you live in Nashville? I'm like, yes, I do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so why Nashville from Minnesota? Curious. Uh, My business partner, Dan, lives in Nashville, and he and I started a company about six and a half years ago where we trained entrepreneurs, bloggers, podcasters, how to be successful. And when I would travel, oftentimes I would fly to Nashville and we would drive to different places. We'd drive to Atlanta and teach and train, or I'd come here for a week to work. And when I knew the flight pattern coming into Nashville, I thought, wow, it's intriguing because I had this second home. And the other reason was I knew I needed to give my children a fresh start, a clean slate. I had given myself it, but their life shifted in such a way, too, that I needed to give them the opportunity to rediscover their own heart, to rediscover who they were. And since I already had become familiar with Nashville, I knew that the move would be still hard, but a little bit easier than going somewhere where we knew nobody. So you moved to Nashville, you're divorced. How did your kids settle in once you got there? Well, they were resistant in the beginning because it was new, because we were leaving everything we ever knew. But now it's been about two and a half years. And my daughter that's here, who's a senior in high school, she actually wrote this paper for her comp class about how one of the best things that ever happened was that I was, she said that I was brave and decided to move the family to Nashville because it allowed her to see the world in a different way. And it's been this unbelievably healing experience for my kids where I've been able to observe them it kind of blossom into this newness of who they are and their identity and where they've been free to no longer live with the past paradigms, but really discover their own hearts as well. Mm, That's beautiful. Well, tell us more about, you know, your low point. It sounds like you just weathered it with like a champ. So what's been going on since that move and since settling in, in Nashville? Well, let's see. There's been a lot going on. I've written a book since I've moved to Nashville. That's probably been my primary story since I've been here was still speaking, still writing my website, but in the process writing a book. And 
for me, when I was writing it, I didn't want it to be kind of on the surface. I really wanted it to be about how do you change your life when the circumstances of your life seem to keep you stuck? Or how do you find happiness in motherhood when you've lost that who you are anymore? Hmm. And so in order to write it, I actually had to go back into the mindset of myself when I was in those super low points. Because I, I really believe a lot of books are written with the perspective looking back and they miss like, what was it that made me change my mind? Because there was a certain point where I had dealt with such severity in finances where somebody would come to turn off my gas. And yet the next day I published an ebook. There had to have been a mindset shift. So I would go back into that mindset of then try to figure out how did I get the bravery in that moment? to deal with this devastating moment and yet have the faith to do something that could change my life. So I wrote that and bless my family and friends that were here because when you go back into stuff, I probably was ultra moody for a good year because mm -hmm. I really wanted to understand the mindset shift, that mental place, because I knew if a mom is reading this and they're in that spot, they don't need the surface answers. They need to have somebody write something where they go, she gets it and she went through it. Yeah. So you're speaking of moms in general. So tell us more about how the book could help the average mom find herself or, you know, be a joy. Let's see. What's the title? Let me say that better. Have a brave heart of motherhood. I want that. <laughs> yes. Makes me think of the movie Brave Heart. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's brave art, actually. Brave art. OK, yes. let me say that again then. The Brave Art of Motherhood. Okay, got it. Yeah, well, and people have asked about the title. So The Brave Art of Motherhood. First of all, I think moms are incredibly brave. We tend to not even see that part of ourselves. We think, oh, that's reserved for other people. But if you've ever stayed up all night, been completely exhausted, cleaned up if your kids are sick, and then got them ready for school, there is a level of deep bravery there in that pushing through and moving forward. And this art part is, I always tell moms to imagine going to a painting, one of those paint and sip classes, and there's an instructor up front and everybody's painting and nobody's painting looks the same. And yet they're profoundly beautiful. Like somebody could have a really cool water part and somebody else's could be a mess or somebody's mountains and all of that. And what's the cool part is we're all painting. We're all trying to do the same story of motherhood, trying to be the best moms we can be, but nobody's looks the same. And that's what's beautiful about it is in a world of social media where everybody seems like we should all be the same. I really wanted to say we can all have beautiful, different stories. Maybe sometimes someone sees and hears is stronger than somebody else's, but we can support each other in the journey. You know, at the end of those painting classes, everybody is loving everybody else's painting. Nobody is saying, mm, you totally failed. Mm -hmm. And that's this camaraderie of what I've wrote, written about. So the book really talks about agreements that we've made about life and makes us look at ourselves, makes us take a moment and be introspective. And then the middle section, I kind of call it the kick in the pants, because sometimes you need a friend that says, listen, you deserve to stand up and run. I'm going to run with you. And it looks at excuses that we give ourselves. And some of them for me were like the excuse of being busy. I'm profoundly good at being busy. I am so good at it. But oftentimes when I was needing to change my life. I was busy in places that I probably didn't need to be busy in. I needed to redirect my busy. Talked about oftentimes moms will say, if this happens, then I can do something. If the money was fixed, then I can volunteer. If this happens, then I can be happy. And it really goes through identifying those gently and then how to break them. And then the last part is about how do you create? How do you actually live this out? So a lot of times I think we get the words about, hey, here's what you're thinking, here's what you should change. The last part is how do you do it and how do you do it with friends? Because that's the biggest call for me is I think as women and moms that we do a disservice when we try to do life alone. And for no time in history do I ever think that women were like on their own mothering. And in this generation, this culture, it's so easy to be isolated. So I wanted to change the culture to say you need to be the friend to others that you need for yourself. Ooh, I love that. Well, so I was recently talking to another mom, not a close friend, but an acquaintance. And she was talking about the reason her kids had turned out is because she had devoted her entire life to them. And I know that all the other moms in the room <laughs> were thinking, right. uh, yeah, we devoted our lives too. And we have 
some different outcomes. <laughs> right, right. What are your thoughts on that in relation to your book? Well, I did chuckle right then because I will tell moms all the time, our children, we could be the best mom in the world and our children, because they're independent, free spirits with their own minds, can make the worst choices in the world. And it's not a reflection on our goodness as moms. And I think that's a very hard pill to swallow sometimes. Like sometimes if my 13 year old, I get a note from the teacher saying, you know, his homework is late again and all this. It's really easy for me to go, wow, I have failed. And to exempt the idea that this is an independent person and it's my job to guide him or her the best I can to love them and to show up. And at a certain point, my oldest is 23, where I have to be be their mom, love them, but also let them go and be their own independent adult. And that's amazing. I would say high five to you if, if you got that story. I can love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can love the mom who's broken too, whose kids have disowned her or she's going through a traumatic time because I can tell you this, they have both started this story wanting the best for their kids and to be the best mom that they can be. Exactly. Another friend of mine, she was saying that kids are like orchids or dandelions. Dandelions are resilient. They're going to turn out how they're going to turn out. Whereas the orchids, which would be about 20% of kids, they're going to be really influenced by their setting, their parents, you know, all of the things. And I thought, oh, well, that could help if we decide, are we raising orchids or dandelions? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that was fascinating. That is so good. Well, let's talk a little bit about mom guilt. So Rachel, tell us a time when you felt incredibly guilty or, or sad as a mom and kind of take us into the emotions of that experience and how you shifted past that. Well, I've had a couple experiences with mom guilt. Sometimes it's a place where it's a reminder. Oftentimes we think, I think we should learn from mom guilt. First of all, it's very easy to dismiss emotions and to say, oh, don't feel it. One time I felt, remember feeling mom guilt because there was a game that my son wanted to play and all weekend I kept putting it off, putting it off. I'll get to it in a little bit, Sam, I'll get to it in a little bit. And then comes Monday morning and he had not only, he actually packed up the game and I thought, oh, like it was that type of guilt where I realized my agenda, I just put him off and off and off. So I learned from it. When he came home from school, we played the game, we moved on. It was a lesson. There was another time where when I would travel a lot, I would travel and speak. I remember being on a plane from Kansas City going back to Minneapolis and crying as the plane took off because I felt this guilt about not being home and working. And for most of my parent journey before that, I was a stay-at-home mom. And then I remembered, I tell this story about my grandfather. My grandpa and grandma were farmers in southern Minnesota. And when I was a little girl, I'd go to visit them during the harvest. And I rarely saw my grandpa and my grandma was always in the kitchen working, prepping food for everybody that was harvesting. But even as a little girl, I never doubted that my grandma and grandpa loved me. Like I always knew they truly did love me. It was just the harvest time. And sometimes as moms, we're in a season of harvest. We're in a time where we have to work or we have to clean the kitchen or we have to say no to them. And when we allow mom guilt to kind of creep into those moments, we're distorting, we're losing the beautiful part of loving our kids so much that we're willing to sacrifice for them. So I want us to be careful with mom guilt because in that way, because it's okay to have to do those hard things. The opposite of it, I would say, is if you didn't work, the guilt of not being able to provide would be exponentially worse. Mm -hmm. And I just want us to have this little bit of grace where we go, you know what? It's okay. It's okay to work or even more, it's okay to take time for myself because sometimes, and I don't know if you have this, but you decide I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to take time for myself and you get going. And immediately it's like the inner dialogue starts. You know what? You should be doing this. You know what? Did you take the kids? Did you play that game? Did you clean? I mean, and it, and it just starts kind of chipping away and we start feeling guilty about taking time for ourselves. Yet I would say, do you ever feel guilty about taking time and put, you know, that when the gas tank on your car says empty, you don't think, you know what? I'm just going to push it for the next 40 miles <laughs> yeah. because you know, you absolutely know you're going to run out of gas. 
yet sometimes for our own self, we're like, you know what, I'm just going to push it just a little bit more. And then we kind of deny ourselves and then we feel guilty for fueling our tank. So I want to be like this voice to reverse the culture. It's good. You're a better mom when you fuel your tank, when you give back to yourself. And not only that, is you teach your kids the importance of self-care, fueling tank, rest and all of that. Exactly. I was just going to say, when I go on a walk, I don't let myself ever go into guilt. In fact, I think, ah, I'm showing my kids, especially my daughters, to take care of themselves so that they don't have to hit the burnout point I hit earlier in my... Amen to that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, this is awesome. And what would be another point you could share with us from the brave art of motherhood? Well, let me think. Or a favorite story. I have to think because I I wrote the book in like a parable way because I think that's how we Ah. learn best is a bunch of stories. And I wrote it sharing a story with the analogy of truth. And, you know, I think a lot of us moms deal with perfectionism too. And I've struggled with it my whole life. My parents knew it. And my daughter, Grace, which I joke about in the book, my daughter, Grace has taught me grace. I don't know if about you with you or anybody listening is oftentimes the names of my children are exactly what I need to know and learn or a space in my life. And Grace has taught me so much grace. Mm. And uh, she has taught me about perfectionism. And one of her lessons that was so profound, it happened when I was writing the book, is we were working on homework and I was looking at grades. And she said to me, do you know, mom, at the end of the semester, because she's in high school, she said, my 93A is the same as my 100A. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of like freedom for somebody that's a perfectionist in that statement. Mm -hmm. And she knew that in order to get her 4.0, that she didn't need to get all 100s. She knew that if she could keep this one at a 93 or 94, she could devote the energy into the others. And a lot of times as a mom, as a single mom, if I was to strive to get everything perfect all the time, I would get nowhere. It would be like spinning my wheels. So I think about Grace with that statement of, I'm going to try my best, but at the end, if it's a 93, it's good enough to get me the A. Yeah, I love that. It's like the 80-20 rule. (laughs) Let's shoot for 80% perfection, not 100 or 93% in your case. Right, right. I'm a 93A gal. Yeah, Yeah. no, but it's, it's so true because, I mean, I can get stuck in just with writing or all of that. And sometimes as a writer, if I make it too perfect, it doesn't relate because it's too perfect. And so I've learned at a certain point just to let it go. And I've also learned that if I make a mistake, like spell a word wrong, use the wrong there because I'm writing, somebody will let me know very yeah, quickly. Right. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. It doesn't need to be a grade of like, wow, you messed up. It can just be this element of being real. And I think there's this beauty in as a writer or as a mom in being willing to have those parts of us that aren't so perfect looking together because it creates that camaraderie that we all need. Mm -hmm. So, so true to let go of that and just be human, really. (laughs) Oh, I celebrate being human. I've learned that if your friend comes over and you apologize for your house being normal, which in my case, when the kids come home from school, means backpacks, places, stuff on the table, probably dishes on the counter. If I apologize, if you come over, I have set the precedent that you have to apologize when I come over or have it all tidied up to a certain degree. So I would say just invite people into your real and don't apologize for just being real because we all have that. Like there's no way to get through motherhood without a messy sink. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Giving other people permission to do the same. Exactly. Well, let's have a quick break for our sponsor, and then we'll come back and talk about all of your favorite things. Swimsuits always look great on the models in the magazines, but the thing is, most of us are not built like models. We come in all different shapes and sizes, and that's why I want to tell you about Miracle Suit. These trendy swimsuits are designed for your individual figure. I love my suit. I was at the Vibrant Happy Women retreat in February and had a fairly cute suit. And then right after that, my Miracle Suit arrived and it looks like I've lost 20 pounds when I have it on. Well, Miracle Suit has tons of styles and sizes and shapes that flatter every body type, including full bust, long torsos and plus sizes. 
Plus, they have a fit guide that will help you find the perfect style for you. Maybe if you want to slenderize your waist or have a little more tummy control. Now is the perfect time to get your swimsuit from MiracleSuit.com. And they're going to give Vibrant Happy Women listeners 20% off through our special landing page. Plus, in addition to the 20% off, you'll get free shipping anywhere in the U.S. So head over now to MiracleSuit.com slash Happy Women and find your dream bathing suit today. You deserve to feel good in that suit. You're going to be in it a lot this summer. Again, that's MiracleSuit.com slash Happy Women. I believe our physical and emotional health is directly tied to what we eat. And the better I plan, the healthier I eat. That's why I am loving Plan to Eat. It's a fantastic tool that you can use from your desktop or your phone that allows you to organize your recipes, clip other recipes from any website, create your meal plan for the week with a couple of clicks, and then spit out an organized shopping list that you can carry around the grocery store with you. It's literally the fastest way I have ever found to get my meal planning done. Plan to Eat is a subscription service with monthly and yearly options for $4.95 a month or $39 a year. And Plan to Eat only has one big sale a year. But if you visit plantoeat.com slash happy women, you can start a free 60 day trial instead of their normal 30 day trial. Healthy eating has never been easier for our family. Go to plantoeat.com slash happy women and check it out. 60 days free. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to talk about your favorite things, if that's okay, Rachel. I would love that. All right. So this is always what moms want to know, to be a fly on the wall in another mom's house. What does your morning or bed routine or both, what do those look like in your life? Well, it's crazy, definitely. But I have learned this one thing is I control how I enter social media. I used to wake up because my alarm is on my phone, wake up and then immediately look at social or immediately look at my email. And I realized that I became a passive participant in everybody else's world. I think it was Brendan Bruchard talks about that when you go into Gmail, that you're immediately a slave to everybody else's agendas. And it stuck with me and it, it's made me think about social media. So when I wake up, I intentionally choose to not go onto social media or any of that until the kids are in school and everything else is ready. And then I enter into the social media world on my own terms. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes so much more sense. You then get the important things done rather than those urgent email things. Well, and I think, too, is whether we believe it or not, but you go on to Facebook, you're immediately inundated into everybody else's world. Mm -hmm. And I'm a huge supporter of like cheering and high fiving everybody and loving everybody's accomplishments. But sometimes it can almost make you if you're not mentally prepared, feel like you're a step behind or feel like, oh, I should have been doing that. And I, I all of a sudden, I started to become aware of all of the emotions that are driven by going into the social world immediately. And it was almost like I wanted to give myself that gift of breath, of perspective, of planning my day before I went in and saw what all was going on. Mm, yeah. And knowing where you're headed instead of getting lost in the flow of someone else's river. Yes, that's uh, yeah. so true. So what else do you do in the morning to kind of fill your cup as you start the day? There's a meditative app. I can't even think of the name of it that I love. If I use that every day, it's just that level of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And then I like to read a book, uh, an actual yeah. physical book. And I set the timer because I get anxious because I think I've got so much to do. And then when it's warm, I do run. And running is an amazing way for me to kind of clear my head and to push myself in ways that I didn't think I could do. Because mm -hmm. for many years, I thought, I told myself, you could never run. You could never run, Rachel, because <laughs> you're a group player. Like you like basketball. And I convinced myself, I, I wrote about this too. Like I convinced myself you can't run. And then where I live in Tennessee, there's a beautiful walking trail. And every morning when I drop off the kids to school, I'd see all these people running. And all of a sudden, one day I had this thought, what if you ran? And I decided to follow that. And I started running. And I tell people all the time with goal setting that my goal isn't to wake up and run two miles. My goal is to put my shoes on, go down my stairs and go out past my mailbox. Because if I get to that spot, I'll run the two miles. 
But oftentimes if I wake up and think you're going to run two miles, I'll just tell myself, mm, you're too busy. Yeah. So yeah. I make micro goals. Yeah. And then once you start the micro goal, it will end up being longer anyway. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What's your favorite happiness tool? Or one My of them. favorite <laughs> happiness tool, it's music, hands down music. I tell, if you think about your favorite movies, there's a beautiful soundtrack that goes with it. And if laundry is daunting, I'll tell people to put Adele's Skyfall on while you're folding laundry, and it will feel like the most awesome experience ever as you're folding those socks. And music to me can be this unbelievable way to redirect focus, whether it's to energize yourself or to calm you down or just to give a little bit of perspective. Music for me is hands down my favorite happiness tool. And your favorite easy meal. Okay, you're going to laugh because I know that you asked for a recipe, but here's my breath of permission to moms. My favorite easy meal is to walk into Kroger, to go over to the easy meals that are prepared for you in the refrigerated section where the where everything's diced for you and the garlic is ready and I'll make that. And I used to feel guilt about that. Like, you know what, if you I would hear myself say, if you were a good mom, you'd walk around and get all these ingredients. <laughs> and I realized I am a good mom when I realize my own boundaries and limitations and what season I'm in. I'm preparing them a meal with fresh vegetables. Somebody else may have chopped it, but I'm taking 20 minutes and finishing it. Yeah. And my kids love it. And that is my favorite thing to do. Okay. You just blew my mind, actually. Okay. We all know about the box meals that come prepared, but this exists in regular grocery stores. How have I missed this? <laughs> It is so brand new. So like I said, I live in Nashville. So Kroger and Publix here have these like meals that are pretty much already prepared. Like, and it's like, it's a kit. So I feel like I'm a chef. My kids are like, look at you, you're the chef. And, but it's pretty much all ready for me. And I just saute it and cook the rice and the wow. kids think it's amazing. Is it cheaper than the box subscriptions or have you compared? I think it's about the same. Uh -huh. And sometimes I look at it and think, wow, it's, $15 or 20 or something. But I've also realized that there are seasons for it. And I'm trading time. I'm actually trading time for convenience at that place. And honestly, it's a good thing. Like I've realized there's a lot of freedom in that moment of deciding tonight, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. That is so great. I can't wait to see if we have it here. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's awesome. It's And I've saved a couple. My kids will be like, could you make that stir fry again? And I'm like, sure, we yeah, can do that. That's easy. <laughs> cool. What's your favorite life hack? Little random trick that helps you. Cleaning my kitchen the night before. Oh, that's a good one. I learned that probably 10, 15 years ago. There was a, a lady on the internet. I think she's still there. Fly lady. Oh, I know her. I know her. Yes, I've met her before, too. And she used to do she was brilliant. She had an email subscription service before social was anything. And one of her thing was shine your kitchen sink before you go to bed. And that changed my life. One simple thing every night cleaning my kitchen sink, because when I wake in the morning and my kitchen sink is clean, I feel like, all right, I'm already ahead. Yeah. So. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one for sure. Favorite book. It's called One Year Off. It's written by David Cohen. It was written like late 1990s. And it's about a family that decides to sell everything and travel the world. They sold all they had in San Francisco and it documents when they lived in France and when they went to Cambodia and Australia. And it's a great story. But what I also love about it is the possibility that you don't have to stay boxed into a norm that the culture tells you you need to do. You can do this and experience things that you didn't even imagine. Hmm. Are you thinking about doing it? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I did travel. I did. I've gone to New Zealand, spoken there a couple of times. I've gone to Haiti and I'd like my kids to have that experience of understanding that they're, that the world isn't just isolated to where they live now, which is partially what I loved about moving from Minneapolis to Nashville is culturally, it's very, very different. My kids sound different than the kids that live here in Tennessee. They just have that Minnesotan voice. And uh, it's just been these cool nuances, even learning that the cart at the grocery store, they call it a buggy here. And yeah. I want my kids to have the experience of, wow, everything isn't the same and where they can learn to respect the differences in that way. Mm -hmm. That's smart. 
And here, water fountains are called bubblers. Isn't that the strangest thing ever? Did you have that in Minnesota too? So I didn't. We called them water fountains, but I had a teacher in high school that was from Milwaukee. Yeah. And he would call it the bubbler. And I just would, I would chuckle, but you know, (laughs) it's the difference between pop and soda. Yeah. Yeah. All those different little nuances, the way you say caramel or caramel. It's fascinating. Just the uh, difference in language in a thousand miles. For sure. Well, what does it mean for you to be a vibrant, happy woman? It means really embracing today the gift of today and planning for the future. You can learn from the past, but it's this kind of tension between really loving the moments that we get to live and living with vibrancy and intentionality for what we possibly could get to live in tomorrow. Mm, That's beautiful. And let's have a challenge from you to our listeners as we close. Well, what I would love to challenge everybody to do is to take the one thing on their to-do list that they keep putting off, keep rolling over to the next day, And doing it today, because I can guarantee you that not only will getting it off the to-do list give you margin and space, but it's also a level of bravery of finally accomplishing the thing that you've been putting off doing. Beautiful. Do it today. Eat that frog, as my friend says. (laughs) I love that quote. It's so true. (laughs) Well, this has been amazing, everyone. Go get your hands on The Brave Art of Motherhood by Rachel Martin. You've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for being on the show, Rachel. Thank you. It was very fun. There are some great nuggets of wisdom there from Rachel. And I know each of you listening, whether you're a mom or not, wants to be that confident person who can do hard things just like that, to move across several states with seven kids as a single mom. That takes gumption. That takes mojo. And if you want more of that, definitely come to the workshop this week. It's on Wednesday or Thursday. I'm offering two sessions. And get some tools. Myself and three other women, we're going to be chatting about what we've done to shift our energy upwards into those higher vibe emotions. And if that sounds like something you want for your life, if you crave more joy, more peace, more happiness, more calm, more radiant energy, make sure you sign up at jenriday.com slash energy. You will come away from the workshop feeling energized and replenished and hopeful that, hey, you can change, you can be consistent in your new habits of happiness. Well, that is everything for this week. I will be back later this week with a happy bit. And until then, make it a vibrant, happy, juicy week. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Vibrant Happy Women podcast at www.jenriday.com.